Alex uh, is also live streaming from his home in Philadelphia this morning. Um, Alex is an art historian, an educator, and a curator. Uh, since January of 2018, he's the Andrew W. Mellon and Darnancourt Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The recent exhibitions there include the Duchamp family that he co-organized with Matthew Afron and Rethinking the Modern Monument at the affiliated Rosanne, Rodin Museum. Alex was previously the Andrew W. Mellon Graduate Fellow in Modern and Contemporary Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and a member of the curatorial team for the exhibition Dancing Around the Bride, Page, Cunningham, Johns, Rauschenberg, and Duchamp. Alex holds a BA from New York University and an MA and PhD in the History of Art from the University of Pennsylvania. He's an internationally recognized expert on the art of Marcel Duchamp, and he publishes frequently on that topic and other subjects in modern and contemporary art. He is also importantly a contributor to the exhibition catalog we published in relationship to this edition that exhibition. Um, today, Alex and I are going to be talking about um, Duchamp's participation in edition Matt, his significant influence on the genesis of this endeavor. And also, um, I believe we'll get into somewhat the reception of Duchamp by a younger generation of artists who are coming, just emerging in their practices in the 1950s and the 1960s as well. Now, um, a few more notes before we jump into the Q&A. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to the Kemper's members uh, and donors who might be joining us today. We really especially appreciate your support at this time, and we're so glad that you could join us um, on this platform. I also want to recognize that Multiplied is uh, a major international loan exhibition that has depended on a lot of supporters. Uh, I'd like to recognize first the William T. Kemper Foundation for their lead support. I also want to thank the Andrew Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Swiss Arts Council Pro Helvetia, all of them for their very generous support. I also extend gratitude to Emily and Teddy Greenspan, Elisa and Paul Kahn, Nancy and Ken Kranzberg, the David Woods Kemper Memorial Foundation, and of course the members of the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum. And finally, for their lead support for our handsome exhibition catalog, I'd like to recognize the Carl and Marilyn Toma Foundation. Uh, So the exhibition, I'm going to show you a few slides um, of the installation at the Kemper. The exhibition was only open for a little over a month before we had to close the museum in mid-March. Um, but it does focus on the pioneering role played by Edition Mat, which stands for, M-A-T stands for the Multiplication d'Art Transformable, or the Multiplication of Transformable Art. And here, I'll just flip through a few slides so you can see a, the kind of the scale of the artworks, the scope of the exhibition and the way it felt in the space of the galleries for those of you who weren't able to be there in person. So Edition Matt was the first series of multiples to find broad participation and distribution in this post-war period. In the, by the late 1960s and the early 1970s, the idea of the multiple emerged as a quite an international phenomena. And Edition Matt represents a really key early articulation of the explosion of interest in this format. The Swiss artist Daniel Sperry, who you can see in uh, the middle of this slide right here, uh, established Edition Matt in Paris in 1959 in an effort to broaden the notion of art and its role in society, producing small-scale affordable multiples encouraged viewer participation through touch and optic version. And the image I'm showing you here is um, a historical installation shot of one of seven exhibitions that Daniel Sperry put together of uh, edition on matte objects in 1959 and 1960. This is one in Germany, Museum in Krefeld. You can see here, if you saw one of these exhibitions in person, you would be um, surrounded by a variety of the multiples. Right here, they're playing with three versions of a work by Jean Tangeli. In the background, you can see three versions of Marcel Duchamp's contribution to edition on matte, his roto reliefs. There's a work by Heinz Mach here as well. So you would come into these exhibitions and you'd have the, at that time the unusual um, prompt to touch and play with these objects, but then you could also buy them directly from these exhibitions and take them home with you. So what Sperry did is he invited a range of artists to contribute concepts for artworks that could be produced in a series of 100 
and which could easily be transported and assembled from instructions. And in many cases, it was actually Daniel Sperry who was constructing the, uh, the art objects himself. Contributors included both established artists such as Marcel Duchamp, but also a range of emerging artists who are working in the burgeoning field of post-war kinetic art. The artworks included an array of objects that could be optically, mechanically, or physically shifted and repositioned. And here I'm just showing you three quick examples of the, these three primary ways that movement was involved with these artworks. So the first work here is a work by the Israeli artist Jakob Agam. It's called Eight Plus One in Movement. And this is a work where you could physically touch the object. So you could pull these pins out or you could move them around, creating constantly new compositions. The middle work is another, is that same work by Jean Tangley that I showed you earlier. This is a work that gets plugged in. You can put whatever objects you want in that clip. When it gets plugged in, it moves incredibly fast and it makes the object start to blur. And the last work here is a work by Jesus Rafael Soto and it's called Spiral. And this is an optical work which plays with the Moray effect. So as you move in front of it, it kind of shifts and creates this kind of vibratory pattern through your eyes. Now the ability to transform the art object is really central here because what Schwery said he was doing is not just creating reproductions of existing works of art, but what he wanted to set up to do was produce this, what he's calling multiplied original artworks. So with these transformable multiples, these, intention, these objects intentionally occupy this very rich but um, unstable position between seriality and unique art objects. Each of the objects were created um, to be sold at a uniform price, no matter if you were a great master. And this is a term that Schwer used to talk about Duchamp, but other participating artists like jo Joseph Albers as well. Or if, if you were much lesser known, like these artists before you, like Agam, Tangeli, or Soto, who were just emerging. The first collection included about 15 artworks um, and was followed by two subsequent editions in 1964 and 1965. And the exhibition at the Kemper shows the entirety of all three collections um, for the first time in the United States. Now Duchamp's influence, which is our subject today, uh, in here, uh, weighs large in addition, Matt. Duchamp is generally credited with conceiving the um, artist multiple, although he never termed it as such. Uh, with works such as his edition Rotor Reliefs, which were originally from 1935, and his Boite en Valise, which began around that same time period. And here I'm just showing you a page from this quite unique exhibition catalog that Daniel Sperry created in relationship to Edition Matt. So it doubled as both an exhibition catalog and a mail order catalog. Each page um, represented one artist who was participating, and you can see here is Marcel Duchamp's page, where you have multiple photographs showing you the different variations of a given object. Um, Sperry sought out Duchamp explicitly to contribute to this collection, um, and he, Duchamp gave him some unsold numbers from his previous edition work, the Roto Reliefs. Sperry understood these works as a seminal forerunner to the multiple, and he often described it as, quote, the first multiplication of an idea that really succeeded. Now, Alex, I'd like to throw it over to you um, after this long introduction and ask you to start here with the rotor relief. Maybe we can say a little bit about, you know, what is this and how does it, how does it work? Sure. Uh, thank you, Meredith. Uh, I, and I'll just start by thanking you for the invitation to join you all today. Um, and for the invitation to contribute to the catalog, which was really a learning experience for me, um, exploring a kind of different part of Duchamp's career and legacy. Uh, thanks also to Meredith Lehman, and to Sivian Ackman, the director at the Kemper, for uh, uh, kindly uh, having me join you all. Um, so these objects are, it's, I'm, I'm really enjoying the opportunity to talk with you about the Rotor Reliefs because they're probably a, a less, lesser known uh, aspect of Duchamp's career, um, unless you're a real Duchampophile, which I know some folks are and, and probably many joining us today are, um, but it's, it's a deeper cut from, from the Duchamp catalog. Uh, basically, there are six uh, discs that are about the size of a vinyl record. Um, they're 20 centimeters across. Um, they're printed um, offset lithographs on, on color lithographs on each side um, to create a total of 12 uh, spiral uh -huh. designs. Um, and they're meant to be activated in, in a specific way on a, in, in the initial uh, 1935 edition. Um, to be activated on a phonograph, a platter, 
and to rotate at a speed between uh, 20 RPM and 40 RPM, so around 35 RPM, um, and in doing so create the illusion of uh, three-dimensional motion. So um, it's coming back to this idea that Duchamp explored earlier in his career and kind of throughout his career of um, taking a two-dimensional form and, use, and creating the, the impression of both motion and depth. Um, Maybe we'll show, uh, I have a brief video to look at so you can kind of get a sense of how these things work in motion. Let me just get that started. So Alex, the idea was that as the thing, as the discs start to spin, right, they kind of pulsate. They give you the sense of kind of moving in and out of, as you said, this two and three dimensions. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, so this began in 1935. Maybe could you anchor this idea for us in Duchamp's career? What's going on in 1935? Where is this coming, coming out of for him? Absolutely. Um, so many, uh, times when we talk about Duchamp, we're usually talking about earlier in his career, um, kind of the 1912-1913 moment when um, Duchamp, you know, his, his training, uh, he's born in, in 1887 in Normandy, he moves to Paris following his older brothers who are already established painters, fine artists. Um, he studies printmaking um, and kind of falls in with the Cubist circle and starts making Cubist paintings. Um, and then it's really in in 1912 that he makes New Descending a Staircase, um, which is a attempt to kind of use the Cubist uh, visual language to convey motion uh, in a way that uh, at the same time the kind of futurists are exploring similar things. Um, and then he goes through this kind of dramatic transformation um, in 1912-1913 where he decides that he wants to explore um, the region kind of beyond what could be recognized as art. Um, and try to invent some kind of um, idiom of creation that um, is completely outside of artistic conventions, but also will not be recognized as anything else. So it's not gonna be a commodity, it's not gonna have any function, um, but it's also not gonna be just for aesthetic delectation. So he starts to invent a series of notions, a beginning around 1913, um, each one trying to kind of uh, challenge himself and, and the market and collectors um, to expand what they think of when they think of uh, art um, and really to kind of just reject the the space the uh, identification of, of art at all so um, many of, of our, our viewers will be familiar with his first kind of invention which is the ready-made um, which he starts creating these found object assemblages um, in in 1913-14 um, then he starts working on the large glass which is uh, again, like a totally invented visual idiom that's unlike anything else. And then this, the rotor reliefs kind of belong to this third category of objects that he starts creating in the 1920s that he calls precision optics or optical machines. Um, and they uh, generally involve some kind of optical illusion. Um, he starts working on them in the early 20s. This is from 35, so it's um, a little later. Um, and it's in a period when he really has uh, uh, publicly retired from making art. Um, he's completely stopped creating paintings, which were originally what he was recognized for. Um, and he's just kind of uh, quietly producing these kind of printed materials, uh, including the rotor reliefs and releasing them um, through his kind of private collectors um, and uh, galleries that he's associated with. Um, this uh, 1935 edition, he, he actually thinks about trademarking as a, or he does trademark the term rotor relief. He thinks about marketing it as primarily as a toy, um, not necessarily a toy meant for children, but a toy meant for kind of um, adults. Uh, it's, uh, and to basically to completely avoid the art market in any way. 
So he talks about trying to market it to like the Macy's department store in New York. Um, he presents it for the first time at an inventor's fair in Paris, uh, where he, he rents a booth and kind of hawks his wares. Um, and I think, you know, Meredith and I, we've talked about this before that he's kind of, um, it's, it's both kind of an, ex, uh, an experiment and, and a kind of adventurous kind of uh, notion for himself, but it's also a very practical consideration of how could one distribute something outside of the art market, um, but also outside of commercial channels. Um, and he's really trying to cultivate the space that very few other artists or other, or other figures are really exploring at this time. So um, I think it is very appropriate that it, it does kind of uh, represent a major precedent for, for Edition Matt. Alex, I wonder if you could, um, so were these pretty uh, economically priced? Were these something that anybody could could buy? And also were these in um, sort of an unlimited edition or is he even moving outside of those art world notions of the edition work? Um, they are edition, but they're unnumbered. Uh, he made 500 uh, copies, but since they're, they were unsigned and unnumbered, um, so they were not uh, prized for their rarity at the time. I, my my impression is he would have kept producing them if there had been demand. Um, so there wasn't much demand at the time. Uh, no, no, not 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 significant demand. Um, I think uh, there's a sense that uh, I think 300 or so were lost. Um, so he sold some portion of the 200 remaining, um, and um, I'm not. I don't know if whether he had any. Af I. I it, it, by 1953, he put out. A, he had to produce a new edition. So my suspicion is that those 200 were sold by 53. Um, and then to your question of the price, um, he sold them both as a set and individually, and they were priced differently uh, for each. But they were fairly inexpensive. Um, I don't have the kind of like um, adjusted inflation uh, price, but um, just a couple of dollars. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the optical illusions themselves. You know, what is he, you know, these are spirals and we already talked about they move between the second and, and the two and 3D dimensions, but what is he doing with all of these different kinds of patterns that we see as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, the, the project is both these disks and then also kind of a viewing device. Um, and you can see that in the slide here Oftentimes these get reproduced in isolation, so it's helpful to see the whole kind of uh, set. Um, you see there are two different kinds of disks. There are some that are purely optical and kind of abstract, and then there are others that include kind of figurative uh, elements. So there's uh, one in the top right here that he called the J uh, Japanese fish, um, and it's a little koi uh, pond with, uh, that would create the illusion of this fish kind of swimming in a spiral. Um, then there's a, uh, a, a, a hot air balloon. Um, and then there are these kind of more abstract, some of them kind of look like irises or um, other kinds of like spiral designs um, that were purely to create the impression of, of motion. Um, and then he, he included these, um, the smaller black disc is like a viewfinder that you would hold up to the eye to look at the design to kind of um, force you to look uh, through a single eye, which would uh, heighten the impression of depth um, because um, monocular vision would, uh, or using two eyes would disrupt the, the illusion. Um, and you see him then uh, continue to, or he had already in 1918 with the large glass, he had experimented with this idea of forcing people to look monocularly at a work of art. Um, and then he, he continues to think about monocular versus binocular vision in Etant de Ney, which is a later one. Um, and then he also included this other black disc, the larger one, and that was to uh, place on top of these discs to kind of isolate them from their surroundings and frame them so that they could be seen as uh, uh, apart from their surroundings to kind of, again, to heighten the uh, impression of, of illusion. Um, and I think you, know, you, I, I, you, it's important to think about like the physical tactile experience of a collector or a uh, owner of one of these. You know, you would be physically picking up these discs, placing them on your phonograph platter. Um, and 
enjoying them for a few minutes and then and then swapping them out for other um, options. So it would be kind of like a um, you're curating your own. There's there's um, kind of a, a random aspect or, or open to chance aspect that he really enjoyed in that um, he always tried to kind of starting with um, the ready-mades and the large glass get away from this idea of authorial control and intent and kind of as much as possible open up his work to the participation of the the viewer to kind of create their own experience or, or shape their own experience and i think you i mean i would love to hear your thoughts about how that kind of the legacy of that with edition uh, matt later on well i think i would like to say something about what how the roto reliefs change in their appearance slightly when they enter into edition matt um, and then after that, let's take a few questions. There's a few questions that have popped up from the audience too. So um, yeah, so exactly, you know, this work is both tactile, as you mentioned, that you can change the uh, the discs and which side you want to see and when you want to see it. And then also it's, it's mechanic, it has a, a mode that's making these things spin. So originally it was um, a record player that was being used. But when it gets to a Duchamp mat, Duchamp gives him the discs, but Duchamp, it's John Tangley, so this is what the edition mat work looks like. John Tangley then um, creates a different format for it to be shown. So it gets hung on the wall um, and it has this small motor and these, you can see these three sort of spindly wires that you just would attach the discs into that and so it can spin on the wall. Um, so I guess, you know, he doesn't have these framing devices anymore, but it does have this kind of velvet covered background, which Duchamp insisted upon. Um, I don't know for Alex, what do you think about this? The, the shift from the record player, you know, that horizontal orientation to it becoming more like a, you know, like a painting or something on the wall. I think that they do that intentionally, honestly, maybe to make it more marketable uh, as, a, you know, it looks like another object you can hang in your house at that moment in the late 1950s. But what, does that have a significant shift for you? I, I think just as you say, it, it takes something that was deliberately created to not look like a work of art um, and to be something non-art, uh, and then it turns it into a visual work of, of art. So um, I think you, we see this um, throughout Duchamp's career, and, and I think we'll cover some uh, other examples later of him kind of contradicting or embracing the uh, contradictions of um, uh, taking some of, of something that was created to not be art that then becomes uh, seen as art later. Um, and, as we all know today, like the ready-mades are very much recognized as works of art, uh, canonical works of art of, uh, in the 20th century um, today. But um, the role of kind of, of historians of Duchamp's work is to remind people that that wasn't how, what they were created to be. It was that initial moment. Um, and so I think this is a really good example of that process by which uh, even within his own lifetime and in the span of a short amount of time, something that he created to be uh, non-art was tr and transformed with his, with his consent and, and uh, encouragement into something that would be seen as a work of visual art. And the, the last thing I'll say, there are some interesting anecdotes. There's um, a series of letters between Duchamp and Schperi, and I think Schperi was hesitant to even ask him. He, all of the artists who participate in here, there's a, a sticker on the back of the works, and they're all signed, and they're numbered, either you know, their number and their edition. Um, uh, he was very hesitant to ask Duchamp if he would sign these works. I think he knew these were originally had a different context with an unlimited edition. Um, but Duchamp, very uh, in a Duchampian twist, you know, he decided he would just send him a whole about 50. He put his signature on little pieces of paper and he sent them to Daniel. Duchamp was in New York at this point, I believe, and Daniel's living in Paris, so he could just stick his signature onto these works. All right, let's take a few questions. Uh, that have come in. I know one, uh, Alex, for you, um, by an anonymous attendee says, do you know if his interest in optical illusion was connected in any ways with scientific theories or a larger interest in psychology? Uh, do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, Duchamp, throughout his career, um, in this kind of interest in um, moving beyond the realm of uh, traditional uh, art uh, and, art, and artistic media, um, Duchamp kind of was like a uh, omnivorous uh, consumer of, of different uh, realms of, of cultural production uh, and 
he was very fascinated by scientific developments um, and by psychology and sociology, all, all kinds of things. He was, he read very widely, um, even though he later kind of downplayed it. Um, and uh, his brothers also were very interested in um, developments in medicine and, and science around the turn of the century. Um, so like, I think like a lot of artists probably um, um, kind of took in a lot of influences and, and, uh, and used them in their production. So Duchamp was definitely um, conversant in a lot of the um, changes in thinking around um, physics and um, the kind of relationship between the individual and their environment uh, around the turn of the century. And so his work is very uh, responsive to that. Um, I'm moving away from the idea of um, a kind of self-sufficient human subject um, apart from their environment and much more into a kind of more participatory, interactive concept of, of human uh, uh, psychology and, and interaction. Uh, it's definitely something that we, we associate with Duchamp. Mm -hmm. uh, could you, there was another question about how these works advance, advancements in technology were part of, was part of his interest as well, like what's happening in the, in the 20s and the 30s. And maybe we all advance the slides. If you want to maybe say a little bit more too um, about his other experiments. Does this make sense, Alex, to talk yeah. a little bit about his other optical experiments from the 1920s? Absolutely. Um, and this kind of ties into this previous question of like, um, how, to what extent was he responding to uh, other things kind of happening? Um, and he definitely was, but he, he always embraced this kind of tinkerer's aesthetic. So he, he never, he was never trying to make something that was completely technologically uh, sound. <laughs> um, and so these objects that you see here um, were all produced in his studio. Um, and uh, sometimes with the collaboration of other artists or friends, um, but they're very fragile. Uh, kinetic objects. Uh, the rotary glass plates here on the left um, was his first kind of uh, motor driven optical machine. Um, and there, there's some great anecdotes of his collaborator, Man Ray, saying that these, um, it's, it's a series of glass, um, rectangular glass panes that <coughs> attach to a central axis or axle. And as the axle spins, it creates the impression of concentric circles. And apparently the, they, the glass panes kept flying off the axle and uh, Man Ray said it almost decapitated him at, at one point. So um, they're not perfect machines. Uh, Duchamp's not, he's not an engineer um, and he doesn't aspire really to be. Um, this other machine to the right, um, Rotary Demosphere, is a little more tech, uh, Duchamp kind of uh, acknowledged the limits of his own um, abilities and actually hired an engineer to work on, on Rotary Demosphere. Um, with the help of a patron, Jacques Doucet funded the research section on uh, rotary demosphere. And so there you actually have a motor um, that um, spins this uh, wheel using a kind of belt system. Uh, and uh, it's a little more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a good point to say, so what by, by 1959, when Edition Matt is first appearing on the scene. Um, how was Duchamp received at this point? Did people really know much about, I mean, Schperi knows a lot about him. I mean, he seeks him out um, intentionally. He knows about the rotor reliefs. Like how would this generation of artists know about these kind of earlier experimentations that, that Duchamp is engaging with? Yeah, um, we, it's hard to kind of return to this moment because today Duchamp is so world famous and well known. Mm -hmm. And his work is is available in a lot of museums and, and online. Um, but in during his own lifetime, um, he was a little bit more of a kind of cult uh, a figure who um, was not readily accessible. His work, for the most part, because he was trying to kind of cultivate these non-traditional forms of production, um, they weren't really collected in any substantial way. They definitely weren't shown in museums for the most part. Um, so they were very hard to find uh, any information about. He wasn't really treated by any historians or major critics at the time. Um, almost all of the original ready-mades were like destroyed or lost almost immediately after their creation. Um, these objects were um, collected by 
private collectors and largely unknown. Um, but all of that changes when Duchamp uh, creates his own uh, mini museum, basically dedicated to his, his career. Um, and that's um, the Bois and Balise, which uh, I'm sure some folks uh, will be familiar with. Um, I know you all have, a, have one of the editions in, in St. Louis. Um, and this is really Duchamp kind of taking, um, putting on uh, his historian's cap and get, providing a little guide to his own career. Um, in, the, in the form of a small box that's a, just about a few feet um, in each dimension. And uh, initially he sold it in the form of a suitcase so it could be easily transportable. Uh, it was relatively inexpensive. And um, he made uh, a few hundred of these and sold them to private collectors and museums around the world. And uh, so this is, he starts selling them in 41, 1941. Um, so by the 50s, th these, uh, these boats, these boxes, are the kind of primary vehicle for people learning about Duchamp and understanding what he did. Um, and they had made their way to Europe, and, and I'm sure Sperry uh, saw them. And it, it, in this box, there's um, kind of miniature recreations of some of these works, uh, these ready-mades that were lost. This is a large glass in the center. Um, and then he also had these kind of uh, paper uh, pages, loose pages, uh, folio pages that he had reproductions on them. And um, some of them, some of these folio pages have reproductions of the rotary, uh, the rotor reliefs, and also rotary glass plates and rotary demisphere. So this is the first moment when Duchamp's like precision optics, his his optical machines become well known through their reproductions in the Bois Um Before that, they were really not widely known or seen. Um, the only major exhibition to feature them is uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in 1936, uh, the Dada and Surrealism show. And that's kind of the, uh, the first exhibition to, to feature them. Uh, but again, it's this example of Duchamp uh, kind of taking something that he had done to not be art and then allowing it to be shown in an art context. Um, there's a great quote from him from 1926 uh, where he he instructs um, the owner of Rotary Demosphere to not show it in, a, in an exhibition. He says, you know, he doesn't want it to be seen as anything other than optics and that basically exhibitions make him sick, is, is what he says in the letter. So um, you see this really, uh, you know, again, like embracing contradiction, but also a kind of change in his own attitude towards the art market and his own attitudes towards his own career. Um, oftentimes with Duchamp, people want him to kind of be one thing over the whole span of his career. But he had a very long career and he kind of changed his opinions and his perspectives um, over the course of them. So I think um, we really have to look at um, all the different Duchamps uh, throughout his career and how um, different he kind of was at different moments. I think, so the what is definitely, you know, one point of distribution for people's knowledge about Duchamp. I, and I think is to your point about how he's kind of shifting back and forth. And I just want to make the point that, you know, he does by the 1950s with this emergent interest in kinetic art, he does become for many of these younger generations, sort of a forefather of this interest in movement and transformation in the arts. I know his, his the Rotary Den, or the, yeah, the Rotary Demospheres, I believe is in the Le Mouvement exhibition, which is an important, one of the first really exhibitions of kinetic art it was in 1955 in Paris. And Daniel definitely know of that exhibition and uh, so that was another, you know, and all of these younger artists would have seen that. So I think somebody like Duchamp along with Maholi Nage and Calder all become these kind of forefathers for this emergent generation in the, in the 1950s. Um, but let's go back to talk a little bit more about the, the what, because the what is uh, another key point of influence, certainly for Daniel, um, uh, Daniel Sperry and his interest in the portable, transformable, uh, you know, distribution of, of artworks. Um, this work is also imminently interactive, right? So it's so you can open up all of the pages. You could rearrange them as you as you wanted again, right? You can make your own mini exhibition of Duchamp's work um, and put a packet up again and pull it out on another day. I wonder if um, can you give us a little bit more insight? You know, he's making this in the mid 1930s. Is there, you know, what is his impetus here? I mean, is he really concerned already about his legacy? Um, uh, or is this more of a kind of thumbing his nose again at the museum establishment? 
Um, yeah, I would say both, uh, both of those things. Um, he, so yeah, again, to put, give it some good context, um, he's working on these optical machines in the mid 20s. Um, in 26, he makes the, or 25, 26, he makes the rotary in anemic cinema, which is a, a short film um, featuring some of these optical discs. And then after that, he does some, he does actually kind of retire from any kind of outward uh, artistic or uh, production or otherwise. Um, he's not really on the scene. Uh, he, this is when he becomes kind of a semi-professional chess player. Um, and he goes on the international chess circuit. As many people know, sometimes people think that this is a myth about him, that he, that he quit art, but he did effectively kind of uh, abandon his career um, and, and um, uh, avoid participating in exhibitions for a number of years. And then uh, in the mid-1930s, in 1934, um, there's a lot of interest uh, in his work coming from the younger surrealist group and Andre Breton, and they convince him to put out um, the Green Box, which is a collection of notes related to the large glass, um, then he, then he com comes up with this idea for the rotor reliefs, and then he comes up with the Blatten Bullies in 35. So it's, these are all, these, those three projects are very much of a piece, and they're kind of, they mark the kind of return um, of Duchamp to his earlier production and kind of a reinvestment in his earlier career. Um, so, I, so again, I think it's a, co it's a combination of like a very practical concern of just, he, he wanted people to be able to see what he had done, and it was extremely difficult to do so because um, because of the nature of his work. And um, he was very lucky to have some very generous collectors in the United States um, who bought up almost his, his entire production. But it meant that um, in Paris, where he was living in the 30s, no one really could see his major works. Um, and again, many of them had also been lost or destroyed. Um, I think also what often is forgotten is that at this time in 35, when he starts work on the large, on the Boiton Belize, the large glass was broken. Um, it was in pieces in a box in Connecticut. Um, so, we, so this work that we today think of as his great magnum opus um, was not, not available, was really not well known. Um, it had been shown just once in Brooklyn um, in 1926 and then shattered in transit um, and left in a box. So, so when he, so the Watton Belize very much is like a, an attempt to um, save and uh, preserve some, some legacy and, and some, um, yeah, some, some way to present his, his career. But then as you, as you said, Meredith, like he's also kind of, it's also a bit of a parody and a, a, he's kind of tweaking a lot of conventions of museum presentation. Um, no museums in really until this point were really that interested in him and he probably not that interested in them. Um, but he kind of enjoyed the idea of kind of taking the conventions of museum display and kind of um, exploiting them for their ability to, to um, catalog and present his work, but then also, um, you know, he, he didn't have to uh, live up to the uh, responsibilities of a real historian. So he's able to um, kind of editorialize and uh, curate his work in his own, in his own personal way. Um, but, I, but I do think it's important to, to uh, emphasize that um, this served as a historical document for, for, for people. So even though it was created by an artist about himself, it, it really took the place of a catalog raisonné or a scholarly um, uh, resource for several decades. Um, and it wasn't until 1959 that there was the first kind of independent um, uh, biography and catalog raisonné of Duchamp's life. So until 1959, the Boiton Bali is what we're looking at here, was really the, the main resource for studying Duchamp uh, mm -hmm. internationally. I mean, I think it's an interesting point to think about him at this point, looking also kind of interrogating ideas of display um, and sort of the convention or looking for alternatives to galleries and museum presentation. Maybe we could just say a little bit here about, it. it's, uh, for me, it's just fascinating to see how all these things sort of layer on top of each other, you know, by the, the late 1930s, the early 1940s, it's also the time period where he's become, you know, he's creating what we see as these sort of early installations. So uh, could you say just a minute, uh, talk a minute about how those kinds of full installations, these environments that he's creating, again, with in relationship to surrealism, how maybe that is another kind of key to understanding these works? Absolutely. Um... So he, he is kind of tangentially uh, 
participating in surrealism in Paris. Um, and the surrealists, like others in the 30s, get very interested in uh, moving beyond uh, traditional artistic media to kind of innovating a more mass um, art experience. And, and they get very invested in exhibition design. And so Duchamp uh, becomes the designer for a series of surrealist exhibitions. Uh, and this is, as you say, the same time he's working on the Boton Valise. So he's really um, thinking a lot about how, how, how the mode of presentation and display and distribution of art affects the experience and the, the uh, meaning of, uh, of a work. Um, so here in 1938, um, with Man Ray's a collaboration again, um, he designs this display format in which paintings are mounted on uh, revolving doors. Um, he kind of uh, creates this kind of sensorial um, environment in which the floor is covered with branches and leaves. Um, the ceiling is uh, these inverted coal bags um, that, um, as people uh, later recounted, like would um, periodically. Um, coal dust would kind of fall on people's heads. Um, it was a darkened room and uh, attendees were given uh, little flashlights to um, direct themselves through the space. So again, it's, it's allowing visitors to uh, uh, curate their own experience and uh, not subject them. I think this, it, the context that um, you were implying too of the, the 30s and early 40s of kind of the rise of fascism and Stalinism um, there was this real <clears throat> desire to move away from any kind of authoritarian um, element of the art exhibition. Like, it, it, the curator should not be forcing anyone into a specific experience. Um, they wanted to allow participants to define their own um, experience. So um, there's a lot of attempts to kind of in inject um, uh, visitor participation or um, democratize the kind of experience of the artistic, uh, the gallery experience in a way that um, I think is interesting looking, if you counterpose that to kind of Soviet exhibition design at the same time, which is trying to do some of the same things, but in a very different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so certainly this is not just about sort of a visual experience. These are all kind of full body, multi-sensory exhibition yeah. practices. And I think maybe this is a good point to talk a little bit about so yeah, the Bois is really for for Daniel Sperry. It's a really a key um, influence. I mean, it also it's not just the it, the Bois exists both as as you say it's sort of this catalog raisonné. It's its own. It's a system of display in and of itself. It's an art object, right? It becomes an additioned art object. It's completely transportable. So it has all those key elements that really inform edition Matt. You can already see them. They're existing in the Bois. Um, I also another thing we didn't really talk about too is that. The, the Bois is full of reproductions, right? These are all, but they're meticulously made reproductions, right? He spent like years making the content to then produce these boxes. So I just want to point that out too, because that's, there's, there's a number of, of points of interest here and in that, that he's really that relationship between the, these kind of handcrafted reproductions that he's making, but then the also, he's also using some mechanically, you know, mechanical reproduction as a way. So that, uh, that blurring of the relationship between the original and the replica uh, also is something that's definitive for Duchamp's career, certainly, but that it's, Daniel is trying to do something in a slightly different, you know, time period in a slightly different way with the idea of the multiplied or original work, sort of having it, you know, both ways, playing off of those kind of blurred distinctions. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out too, I think that, uh, you know, all of what we just talked about, you know, Duchamp has had many hats, right, that he's, he's uh, holding here. He, he's a curator, you know, he's doing exhibition design, he's, he's curating, he's publishing, you know, uh, things with the Bois en Valise, he's uh, manufacturing these things, he's distributing them. Barry is doing the same thing. He has all of these hats. He's making everything in addition that practically, at least in the beginning, he's the publisher, he's the curator, he becomes you know, an artist in and of himself. So I think Duchamp, even as a, a role model for rethinking what the artist is and what the artist does is, a, is another key point here too. I think in the, uh, for time, we have a couple more topics that we wanted to cover and we'll see if there's a few more questions. I think we should jump in. One thing we haven't really talked about 
only sort of, uh, you know, skirting the idea of the ready-made. And that's another, so in addition to the rotor reliefs and the bois, I think the influence of Duchamp ready-mades, maybe we could talk a little bit about that before we kind of move to a conclusion. Um, could you say a little bit more here, I'll bring up the bicycle wheel for us, about, again, the, the influence of the ready-made and maybe how the reception of it changed from Duchamp's original conception of it and then maybe how they were understood in the 50s? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, you had said something earlier about the edition map being kind of um, exploring the space between seriality and uniqueness. And I think um, the ready-made is this earlier moment where um, Duchamp is trying to move away from the idea of the unique painting or un uh, the work of art that um, is defined by the artist's touch. And so he's buying manufactured goods that um, could be um, identical and imminently reproducible. Um, and then he's tweaking them in ways that make them unique. So he's kind of, uh, but they're unique, but they're also uh, recreatable. So he, he takes a, uh, you know, he goes to a store, buys a bicycle wheel, or he finds one in the trash and inverts it and places it on a stool. Both of those elements um, could be purchased and, uh, you know, uh, so many times over and reassembled in this exact same way. And it doesn't matter that Duchamp was the one who, who, in, who assembled it or someone else was. It's, um, there's no need for a kind of unique individual to have created it. Um, and that's kind of how the ready-made start. He's really creating them at the same time he's working on the large glass and he's kind of interested in the ways that uh, manufactured goods or kind of machine-made products kind of get imbricated with um, human production and artistry and kind of the ways that, um, yeah, that these two things have kind of been wedded in, in the modern age. Um, but then in the 50s, the ready-mades kind of experience this resurgence of interest and they kind of stand in as a um, kind of, in, they become kind of a pol polar opposite to abstract expressionism and the kind of um, gestural painting of the 40s and 50s, and they kind of represent this more con cool conceptual um, mode of art making, where it's really not about the temper of some genius artist, but it's more about the um, artist as a kind of uh, engineer or inventor who's coming up with ideas that could be reproduced over and over again or could be distributed in new ways. Um, so a lot of younger artists who are looking for kind of an alternative to abstract expressionism start looking to Duchamp and the ready-made. Um, and that's where you, you see Neo Dada, Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg, Pop Art, Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, looking to Duchamp and talking about Duchamp a lot in their early uh, years as a um, innovator and kind of a, a model. Yeah, and that's certainly a touch point for Daniel says often, I mean, for him, it's very much it's the idea of the work. It's not like the hand of the artist that matters. It's the concept that matters. Anybody could produce these additioned multiples, but it's not, it's the idea that each artist brings to the table um, or the, the prototype, I suppose, that matters the most. Let me go back to one question from the audience before we kind of move on to one more uh, key twist in Duchamp's ready-mades. Um, one question was about the uh, the size of the rotor reliefs. I think that was early on. We should just reiterate. So that they were about the size of a record, right? They're well, smaller record, maybe a. Yeah, they were, they were uh, twenty centimeters, so about eight inches or so. Right. Yeah, so they're domestic. Again, this is like a domestically scale. This is something you bring into your home. They're easily distributable, portable. You can put it away, take it out, and play with it as whenever you like. Um, mm -hmm. And there was one other question about going back to the surrealist exhibitions uh, about are there are the catalogs of the surrealist shows in Paris are there catalogs that exist if people are more interested knowing more about them there absolutely there are um, I mean they're rare books at, at this point um, but they're collected by several libraries across the United States uh, MoMA and, and several other places if you look up on world cat um, you can find a local copy hopefully um, yeah, and Duchamp was involved in the catalog design in many cases. So there are also works, there are art objects in their own right. Um, I've written on kind of the ways that um, 
Duchamp uses the catalogs as a kind of uh, uh, secondary space for uh, exploring certain ideas in his work. So I think it's, the catalogs are really interesting and, and worth checking out. Right, as another venue, sort of in and of themselves, right. Uh, there's another question here um, from Bunny Burson. Uh, what was Duchamp's means of reproduction for the images in the Bois? Did he innovate or use something already invented? Um, he did use something already invented. Um, he, uh, as Meredith was saying, there they kind of um, there are these kind of uh, handicraft objects. Like he really he he avoided using the most uh, readily available, easiest technology at the time, which would have been like lithograph uh, printing. And instead, he, he used collotypes, which were a kind of earlier 19th century um, printmaking technology that involved um, printing in color by, by using stencils. And kind of, it's a much more laborious, prolonged process. So, um, but, it, but it allowed him to kind of, in his opinion, kind of more accurately uh, reproduce these um, paintings and, and get better colors. and. Um, I think I think it was a combination of a very practical desire to have something that he was happy with, and um, and and a more kind of conceptual uh, interest in making something that stood stood as almost like a unique art object because these stencils all had to be hand applied. So there there was no kind of, there was some mechanical aspect of the production of the bot, but it was also extremely laborious and individually made um, in most cases. And here, one more question for you, Alex, from Juan Restrepo. Uh, does Duchamp's art practice and ethics allude to a philosophical doctrine? Is he interested in Marxism, maybe Hegel? And if so, what concepts does he derive from these phenomenologists? That, that's a great question. Um, definitely worth an entire you know, semester. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, again, Duchamp was, he was an omnivorous um, uh, 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 reader, really engaged with um, a lot of the big ideas of his time. When I, when I teach on Duchamp, I usually start the semester with Marx and Descartes. And Duchamp kind of, those were the, the big, big figures that he was kind of responding to, like, like many people in the early 20th century, um, you know, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, you know, his work explores um, issues of labor and, con and consumer capitalism and um, trying to um, think about the ways that people relate to their environments. Um, and he's kind of, in a lot of his work, he's trying to explore like new forms of logic outside of um, standard logic. And, you know, he's really, he is really engaged with a lot of uh, major ideas. Um, I think. Um, in, in this question, there, the implication is that he's kind of um, trying to illustrate uh, a doctrine that's out there in the world, but he's actually kind of trying to define or invent his own kind of doctrines of, of uh, living and, and thinking. So um, I think there's a kind of Duchampian uh, philosophy that myself and, and many other Duchamp scholars have tried to um, study and, and, and explain o over the years. So. Um, it's a very rich um, vein. He, he was a, he wrote a lot as well. So he's one of these artists that um, has a very deep um, library uh, of scholarship uh, based on his writings and his artistic production. So um, Juan, there's there's a lot to read in this area, and um, I, I encourage you to to explore it. It's it's really rich. I think we have time maybe for one more topic to cover, Alex, before we should wrap things up. Um, I just thought it would be nice to end on one more twist with Duchamp to talk a little bit about how, you know, he's participating in Edition Mat, which is sort of the beginning of this trend toward multiples in 1959. By 1964, he kind of infamously um, re-editions all of his ready-mades, right, with um, the gallerist Arturo Schwartz, um, who's based in Milan. For some people, this was sort of sacrilege that he would do this. The ready-mades were supposed to be just appropriated objects, right? And then he, again, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how he did this, but again, it's this confusion between, you know, the original and the reproductions. He meticulously, like, reproduced and had them refabricated, I believe, right? These are no longer just appropriated objects. These become sculptural objects in and of themselves. So. Maybe you could, we could end on talking a little bit about what Duchamp is doing. This is just a few years before he dies, right? It's the middle, mid-1960s. 
each of these are editions of eight. I think some people see these as, as multiples or a possible response to this new trend in multiples. Um, but for me, they're not exactly multiples. They seem more to be following more of a sculptural tradition. Could you talk a little bit more about these? Yeah, absolutely. And I would love to also ask you kind of um, about uh, Daniel Shapiro's uh, own thoughts about this. But um, I think there is a question of whether these were um, responding to Edition Matt's uh, own uh, approach to the multiple. I mean, he this was in 1964, so it's after he was invited by uh, Shapiro to participate in Edition Matt. Um, I think it's a very it's a very complicated moment in Duchamp's career. It's it's um, towards the tail end of his work on Etant Donné. It's um, you know his health was not great in the mid 60s. He dies in 68, um, and he he spends a lot of the 60s kind of uh, making works that are um, referring back to his earlier career, and um, this is one example of it. Um, this is he he. I, I, again, I think it's a combination of practical concerns. So by, by the 60s, there was a huge amount of interest in the ready-mades, but they were very hard to find. Um, very, most of them had been destroyed. Um, so it was a very practical idea that he would just kind of refabricate um, eight you know, versions of this one and allow them to be sold to private collectors, but mostly to museums. So um, in many cases, or our, our viewers, if you've been to a major museum and seen these works by Duchamp, oftentimes you're seeing these 64 um, replicas. Um, but they're very um, artistically made. I mean, they're made by uh, you know, artisans in Italy, um, commissioned by this gallery um, by Arturo Schwartz. Um, and they had to be because um, the originals were all found objects that were manufactured around the turn of the century. And those objects were no longer in production by 1964. Um, and in some of the earlier cases where he had, he had um, started replicating ready-mades in the 50s, and in some of those cases he had gone out and found um, old, like an old urinal or an old you know, bicycle wheel or, or whatnot, a flea market or garage sale kind of situation. Um, but by 64, that wasn't really practical. And it wasn't practical on the scale that um, Schwartz was trying to do. So yeah, they very laboriously, like, you know, they, they referred back to archival photos of the original ready-mades and very carefully tried to replicate them directly. And then they existed, you know, on the art market and still do to this day as kind of standalone fine art objects um, and are painted, you know, perfectly. Um, and I think um, for the younger generation of people who really venerated the original ready-mades, this felt like a real, um, contradiction of, of the original idea of the ready-mades. You know, if the original ready-mades were this kind of um, invert uh, or rejection of the art market and a kind of commentary on, on commodity uh, culture, um, these felt like a real embrace of the art market and a real embrace of commodity culture. Um, and so Duchamp was, was kind of challenged on this several times and his response was always that he embraced contradiction and that he, he uh, was always open to to kind of change throughout his career. Um, I, I, I think, again, the kind of theme throughout this talk is that he was also just very practically minded and wanted to make sure that there was a way to present his work in, in museums all over. Um, and that um, also to kind of uh, make, some, make some money. I mean, he, his work never sold well uh, um, on the private market as, uh, compared to some of his peers and um, he was, you know, concerned for his legacy and his estate. I think, you know, these are these are that's my reading on his psychology. So, I think uh, it's a very reasonable and, and understandable um, thing. Right. I mean, I think in terms of your question is how did how did, you know, people like Daniel Sperry of the younger generation. I first. He, I know I've read interviews where he talked about it and just sort of thought what he was doing with Schwartz in these replicas was sort of a big joke. I mean, I think he saw it as one more twist in Duchamp's kind of constant, like, you know, moving back and forth between, um, you know, or kind of undermining uh, his legacy to a certain extent. So I think certainly there were other people who didn't, who did feel like this was very much like a, a an ironic undermining of his original concept. But for Daniel, I think Daniel, 
very much moved in between these ideas too, you know, between he didn't have a problem necessarily with, um, you know, entering into the commercial side of things too. We, um, I mean, that's what addition meant, you know, it's bandying back and forth between being at a commercial enterprise, but also having this sort of more egalitarian and democratic kind of sanguine push towards it and democratizing the art object as well. So trying to balance those two things that goes, that makes all the sense in the world to somebody like, like Daniel and a lot of his contemporaries. Um, I think at this point we've hit our, we went beyond our hour mark. So I would like to say if there are any other questions from the audience, I think we could take another one or two. Um, but if there are, are not, I'm not sure if I can see anything popping up, uh, then we would, oh, uh, we have a thank you. So I think maybe we should wrap things up. We, uh, I want to thank you so much, Alex, for your time, um, for your contributions to the catalog, but for your time here today too, and your insights about Duchamp and ideas of replication and distribution. Um, I think we will be trying to um, launch an exhibition website so that more people can see more of the installation shots and have more information about the edition mat exhibition. Uh, and oh, there's a few more questions. Let me see. Well, I'll just say while you're doing that, uh, Meredith, that I, I, I've I really enjoyed uh, this today. And also, I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, edition mat in this kind of moment um, that we're all in. And I think that your exhibition is really um, pertinent to thinking about new ways of uh, thinking about art production and distribution in this time when everyone's at home and, um, you know, in a, in a moment of economic uncertainty um, mm -hmm. when we're moving away from the kind of luxury art production and distribution models that we um, had before all this. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from Edition Mad and also from Duchamp um, for, um, yeah, models for, for rethinking um, a lot of the accepted uh, ways of, of, you know, museums and galleries and, and artists studios have been operating. Right. Yeah, thank you definitely, Alex, for that last comment. And we do um, want to thank you all for joining and that we hope that you will all continue to be well and join us in the future for another one of these virtual events. Okay, take care. Thank everyone. you. <laughs>